grandmother's secret pie recipe. But the problem is your phones may be tapped. And so you need to make sure that nobody is going to get your grandmother's secret pie recipe. So what do you do? You pull out your high security telephone and you insert this special little key into the side to make sure that nobody is going to steal your secret pie recipe. And this talk is not about the secret telephone, but it's about the key that fits into the special telephone and how that works. So with that in mind, let's talk about that a little bit more. What are these telephones? So back in the 1980s, uh, the National Security Agency uh, had in use this something called a STU-2, that is a Secure Telephone Unit uh, Generation 2. And it was this kind of this largest uh, sort of system that you see there. And uh, the issue was you really couldn't have one of these on every desk. There were these giant sort of rack-sized things. And then you'd stick, gosh, I can't remember, something like four or eight of these telephones uh, per one of these things. So it wasn't really portable. Uh, you really couldn't have one at every desk. It was just kind of a bit of a monster. And uh, so the question was, how could they get more like Department of Defense uh, systems, you know, people in their offices, you know, make, make crypto more of a common thing for defense purposes instead of that special thing that, you know, just the president had or, or whatever. And so the idea is, uh, they said, okay, we're going to make a third generation of this system, which they called the low-cost terminal, or LCT. So this is the STU-3, Secure Telephone Unit Generation 3. And they also called it the Future Secure Voice System, because, you know, it's going to replace the uh, STU-2. And so, yeah, and that's what this talk is about. It's about the third generation system, more or less, that got used in the uh, U.S. Uh, for, like, defense uh, purposes and whatnot, with a focus on that key there. So let's talk about a little bit more about that key. So what is this? So this was kind of a, uh, actually I have one here. So let's see. Ah, ah, so let me give an anecdote on that. Uh, so I probably should have, yeah, so I should have, um, I can, I can get into the next slide, actually, but that is a great question. The short answer is I'm not using the military ones. There's a civilian version. Uh, so, so he uses this, uh, this key right here. And uh, the idea is we're going to talk about what this key is. And so, yeah, I, uh, I found out that uh, you, while there was kind of a military version of this phone, for a certain basically critical infrastructure, you know, think of maybe, um, you know, even like DNS, for example, I found out uh, some people that were uh, registrars, that they basically had one of these in case, uh, you know, DNS went down on the internet. Like, think, think of the scale of the problem that, that that would be. And so they had this for emergency use that, like, hey, if, if things got really bad, like, get out the secure phone, like, we need to sort this out. Absolutely has to be, you know, no one can spoof this. And so it's a limited use. Uh, this is called the Sectel 9600, is the unit on the left, made by Motorola. And I found someone that had one of these. Uh, you know, as a civilian, you can buy them, like they're not a restricted item. Uh, a so-called Type 4 encryption device, uh, if you're familiar with that. I think it uses DES encryption. I, I think you even, I'm not sure if you can export it from the United States, but uh, they certainly were exported. Um, and, and the one on the right is kind of a competitor from AT&T. Uh, that's called the AT&T 4100. Uh, similar sort of idea. Uh, if you look very carefully, you can see this kind of black circle in the uh, lower left. Uh, that one actually uh, doesn't even have the little uh, little key thing on the side, but um, you know it kind of had a related model that did. And so yeah, anyways, so several uh, civilian versions of these phones, and that's kind of what I'm playing with. So let's talk a little bit more about the uh, the key itself. So they made a bunch of versions of this key depending on the uh, the memory present. Uh, you could either have uh, more or less memory. I, I don't remember the exact sizes, but I think only one version with you know 64 uh, kilobits, I think it was, was the one that really shipped. I think that's what the 64K is in there. So the KSD64A is the one that you hear mentioned the most, but really there's other versions like PK, uh, 64KA, and whatnot. Gosh, uh, this one says on it uh, PKA64, for example. You see it just has a smaller head, but it's uh, electrically the same device. And the thing that it goes into is called a key septicle. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a funny little, uh, yeah, so a funny little thing. You can uh, see one right here. And, uh, yeah, you can uh, put this in here if I get in the right orientation and uh, turn it. Anyways, so, yeah, very little interesting uh, plastic device and fitted on the side of the uh, phones. But, okay, so this is all very good. So I managed to get, I get one of these phones. They're, they're relatively rare. 
uh, but I acquired one. And um, great, everything should be good, right? Well, there's a problem. These keys are extremely hard to get. Uh, you know, uh, this is more or less the only one that I possess, so please don't take it. Uh, and, and so the question was, okay, how can I make this project work if I don't have keys? In fact, I started talking to other people. I found a few other people that have these phones, and guess what? Nobody else has keys either. And so I couldn't get keys from anyone. I couldn't get anyone to talk to my phone because they didn't have keys to, to start their phone, and this was beginning to be a, a problem. Uh, <laughs> And uh, in case I didn't mention, the reason why I like this project is, you know, you have like encryption these days. It's so boring. You go to a website and like, wow, like encryption happened, but like you don't really know. This one is like, oh my god, encryption key, encryption. <laughs> like tactile feedback on encryption, wow. What, we've, we've regressed as a society so much. Uh, anyways, <laughs> so, so that's the key. <laughs> so, so the question is... We, um, if, if, you know, if we can't, if we can't get the keys, uh, you know, I looked at this thing and I said, man, you know, this, this thing does not look like the most complicated device. I bet that I could make my own keys. And so, uh, the question is, what would it take to make a clone of this key? Now, this is a little, I, I don't want to say it's complicated. No one part of this is complicated. But we have both an electrical and a mechanical form factor here. So it complicates a little bit to make a clone. And that's a little bit different than I've done. I've done a lot of PCB cloning, you know, chip cloning even. Uh, but you know, integrating everything into electromechanical assembly was a little bit different than I'd done in the past. So I first started by just making uh, mechanical reproduction. So I got out some calipers and uh, CAD program and just said, OK, uh, can I make a CAD model of this? And sure. And then, uh, yeah, you can see uh, kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. And then uh, these are two slightly different models, but you can see, you know, roughly equivalent. Uh, at least if you're really far away, you know, it probably looks like a real one. Uh, and so I was like, okay, great. And, uh, you know, these things will fit into these uh, key septicles, so that's all good. So the next question is, okay, I, I only have one of these. I can't do destructive analysis on it. What can I do to figure out what's inside this thing? And there were a few options. So first, because this got used in defense use, even though it was, it, it, you know, civilian version as well, there's so-called national stock numbers for these things. And as part of that, there's actually quite a lot of information about the supply chain management on these parts. And lo and behold, as I look over it, you see these things from Zycor, and uh, there's also uh, advanced micro devices, and that's rather interesting. Uh, it turns out that, that is the chip that is inside these, or at least presumably, because I've never opened one up, uh, but at least it seems compatible. So I was like, great. I have a pretty good idea of the silicon that's inside these, and uh, if you're not familiar with uh, 28 series uh, EE proms, because you know maybe some of you use like a 27, you know C64 or something, this is the uh, the EE prom version instead of the E prom version, uh, so electrically erasable. Okay, so that's great. So now we know what chips in there, but what's the pinout now? So a few things we could do. Fortunately, this website called Crypto Museum had a number of x-rays for these things. So the next thing I did was I said, okay, uh, I've got a PCB for one of these things. I was able to look at and figure out, okay, where is power and ground? And now using these x-rays, I can make some pretty educated guesses about where the rest of the pins are. Uh, assuming that it was linear uh, pinout with the, the normal you know, AMD parts. And for the most part, uh, everything's just a one-to-one. -one. But if you look on there very carefully, there's a few areas where I honestly have no idea why. They decided to get really creative and arrange the pins. Um, but anyways, for the most part, it's just kind of a one-to-one -one mapping. And so, okay, that's pretty cool. And then we also want to test this, because the other thing I was a little bit afraid of is, uh, well, for one, we don't want to fry our only telephone. Uh, and, uh, you know, something is just a little more accessible. So it turns out there's this other thing called a PKS703. And what this is is a desktop peripheral that allowed you to set up the encryption keys. <laughs> well, I missed, was there a little comment there? Yeah, yeah, so, so much, much to my surprise, oh, it gets better. <laughs> you have no idea. I, have you noticed I'm uh, just jumping ahead? Yeah, I'm wearing a t-shirt. Was that easier or harder to get than the keys? Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll go to that. I've, whole, I have a, <laughs> I've, got like, I've got like the mug, like, yeah. You, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, worked, I worked hard for that mug. <laughs> uh, so, so anyways, so yeah, so yeah, I was honestly surprised that I found this on eBay, let alone, you know, 
But yeah, I, I, I found one on eBay, believe it or not. And this was great because, uh, you know, it allowed me to uh, take the guesses from the... Uh, <laughs> allowed me to take the guesses from the, uh, the x-rays and whatnot and actually do, put a logic analyzer on it and do, okay, are these connections really uh, the connections that I, uh, I thought they were? And so yeah, I put that on there, put a key in there. Uh, it's very accessible and, um, you know, versus the phone, which is like a labyrinth of, of circuit boards and all this stuff. And uh, yeah, so made a little uh, a test board. And uh, okay, so now we've got a circuit board that might work. And so the next step is, uh, I said, okay, I need the mechanical aspect. And so I played around with a few different designs. Uh, started out with a thing on the left. You can see uh, one or two of them 3D printed. Uh, I print at the local uh, UPS store, and I gave them a bit of a hard time uh, because <laughs> most people just print really like, you know, statues and stuff like this. And I said, okay, this has mechanical tolerance issues. Uh, it's got... It's got this giant cavity of film material, and so I only ordered one, but the question is, why do I have two? It's because they had to keep printing them because they kept not uh, printing correctly, and I, I convinced them to let me take the extras. Uh, so I ended up with a few of these things, uh, and after a lot of, a lot of uh, tests on both my and their end, um, yeah, I kind of got something working and uh, got the uh, circuit boards back, and uh, ultimately what I found out, though, was par partly due to... Uh, uh, tolerance issues on the 3D printing, uh, even with DFM stuff I added on here, the teeth honestly hurt more than they help. So I ended up ultimately just cutting them off with an X-Acto knife uh, for the most part. But anyways, so we see we, we've got a board there and uh, actually I had that board until very recently. It, it's no longer with us. We'll get back to that. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, uh, so, so anyways, we got that there. And so the question is, does this work? You know, because now we've got the mechanical aspect, we've got the electrical, uh, and you can see it there, like, ready to, to test, you know, like, are we good? Okay, and uh, no. Uh, but can we fix it? <laughs> yes, we can. So uh, I put the logic analyzer on, and basically what the issue was, was I had done a read test, uh, and for writing, there was an extra uh, control signal. So as soon as I did a logic analyzer uh, test with write, uh, it was very obvious that I had... Um, one of the lines uh, you could kind of confuse with read, but write became more critical. Swapped those two, and then, uh, yeah, uh, it seemed to work after that. Uh, went to the phone, was able to uh, load things on using this, and uh, everything's great. You know, I've got, I've got reproduction keys now, and I, and I kind of did a small run of these and uh, distributing them and whatnot. So that part's all great. So, so at least for the main project, that's kind of, uh, that was all done, and I'm pretty happy. Now, as some of you may have guessed, uh, there's also a bunch of uh, really random stuff that I also did. So, so the first question is, um, you know, this PKS703, yes, I found one of these. Uh, but I had other people who had phones, they wanted to load keys and stuff, and the question was, do I mail them? You know, like, what's, what's kind of the deal with that? And some of you uh, may know I'm a big fan of this project called the uh, TL-866. You know, I write open source firmware for that. Go check out OpenTL-866 if you have some weird algorithm you want to program. Anyways, it turns out, though, even the stock firmware supports the uh, chip used in these keys. Uh, so what I did was I designed this little uh, adapter board. And so now you can see that with a TL-866. And so now we can just use off-the-shelf hardware uh, to read and write the keys and no longer need this special little uh, adapter board. Next problem, uh, these uh, key septicles are also extremely rare. Uh, similarly, like, uh, there actually was a lot of these on eBay, and uh, somebody wanted like 50 bucks for a bag of 50 or something. I was like, oh, that's so expensive, I don't want to buy that. Because I wasn't that serious about this project at the time, and I figured no one was going to buy it. Well, much to my frustration, somebody else bought it. I have no idea why or who. Uh, anyway, so I was like, okay, I want, I want something now to, to deal with that. And so what I did was I took some LEDs uh, and I made an improvised uh, socket for this. I've got this uh, over here. So the idea is that um, I can, instead of using these very rare key septicles, uh, just take one of these and uh, you know just kind of finagle it in there. It looks like it got bent a little bit in shipping. But anyways, you get the idea. So that kind of fits in there. And now we've got something that's you know just using a few dollars worth of parts is very accessible all you know, readily available off the shelf, and we can now read and write these keys. So that's pretty cool. Uh, now here's my, here's my favorite part of this. So as part of this, I love mugs. And so I found this mug on eBay, like wow, what, what a niche thing. Like, 
I can't believe this mug exists. And I'm like, I have to have that mug. Like, I was really, I was really excited about this mug. And uh, I, then I got this email. And, you know, this is like, I was so, I was so devastated after receiving this email. Uh, but then I had an idea. I, I heard about Fiverr. And I was like, I bet I could pay someone on Fiverr to, to recreate this. <laughs> and so, yeah, I have cloned mugs, and I gave some of these out. And, <laughs> and now I have my Stew 3 mug. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one, one final thing is uh, I also found this, uh, this T-shirt, which, um, man, I, I call this a unique design on this T-shirt. Um, you know, I don't know. It's, uh, it's definitely not like current generation in graphic design. That's, that's, all, I'll say. that's all I'll say. Uh, but, you know, I was like, wow, I have to have everything. So, you know, uh, similarly, I, I found one of these T-shirts and, uh, you know, with better images than this. Uh, I also got someone to uh, reproduce this, basically. And so, so now I have a, a fake T-shirt as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And uh, as, I, as I composed this slide for the first time, I actually had put these side by side. I realized I sh there was supposed to be a blue tinge on the right guy. But anyways, they're, they're close enough for my purposes. Uh, and I'll let people awkwardly stare at me later. There's a spelling mistake on the t-shirt. So, you know, you can go find it if you're really that excited. Okay, so almost done. One very final thing. Everyone was promised a chip decapping. Uh, so I was like, okay, I need to, I need to decap a chip. So here, here is one of the, um, here is one of the uh, chips that's used in these uh, adapter boards. So what I did was a ceramic package, easiest to open up. Uh, so actually, this was just a few hours ago. I, uh, I took a torch and uh, torched the uh, chip to heat up the, uh, the, the glass frit between the ceramic layers, and then used these, uh, basically a clamp to pull it up when the glass just got hot, which keeps the pins in place and then took a few quick snaps with my uh, cell phone. So there we go, chip decapping. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed, and uh, let me know if you have any questions.